Hello, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. Today we have me, Francie, Kyle, and Max joining us all from the Out of Spec team. So welcome y'all. We're gonna dive Hi. into a little bit of the story about Volvo Energy and Connect Energy and the second life of EV batteries, which are definitely a question when it comes to the life cycle of EVs. So I asked Kyle and Max to read up about this a little, but what can you tell us off the bat about this collaboration between Volvo Energy and Connect Energy? Sure. So first, just to prevent confusion, I'd like to point out Volvo Energy is part of Volvo Group. Volvo Group is not Volvo Cars. So the Volvo Cars you know today that makes stuff like the XC60 and Volvo and Polestar, their side brand, uh, that's separate. Volvo Group is primarily known, I think, to viewers in the US and Europe for their trucking applications and their kind of commercial industry um, products. And so it makes a lot of sense here because we're talking about battery battery energy storage solutions, which are typically a very like industrial heavy duty use case. The idea being that you take, uh, you know, electric car batteries or cells from somewhere and you repurpose them um, instead of recycling them, you directly reuse them in a second life situation so that they can uh, help, say, provide uh, fill in for power grids or all kinds of basically helpful uses that just gives them a longer life without having to actually scrap those materials and reuse them in another product. Right. Because at the end of the, at the end of the life for an EV battery, it's not totally used up. You know, there's still like a large, uh, percentage of the battery that's able to be used in other ways. And if we're not recycling it, like breaking it down to those raw materials and then building them back into a, another battery, then what are the creative ways that we can try to close the loop and not just have e-waste or just go direct to recycling? So it'll be also be interesting to see what batteries, you know, are recycled and then what are reused. Um, so yeah, I think the goal here obviously is storage and optimizing energy. One note that I read was that they might use these batteries at EV charging hubs. Uh, what do you think about that? Makes sense. Uh, EV charging hubs, especially when you don't have uh, consistent demand or consistent load on the grid, it's really great to shave your peaks so you don't get huge demand charges. And it's also cleaner for the grid if you're not doing a huge spike middle of the day when electricity is the dirtiest. Um, so there's some, some environmental benefits. There's some costing benefits to having battery pack storage or some sort of energy buffer on site for a DC fast charging location but it doesn't necessarily have to be a fast charging location it could be factories it could be buildings it could be anything um the big question for me comes okay where are they getting these batteries from and like max mentioned these aren't coming out of volvo ex30s these are going to be coming out of semi trucks out of uh, we've even seen some volvo uh, like construction equipment some of these crazy excavators that are battery electric and uh, part of the the materials is this is early days for this project Volvo uh, Group, of course, is separate from Volvo Cars, but there is a lot of technology sharing. They do talk to each other. They do interact quite closely. Um, and one thing that Volvo Car side has been pushing for a long time is trying to make the life cycle of their car more recyclable uh, and better for the grid. And I think now we're starting to see this happen more towards the larger scale stuff. So all positive for me. Um, but but let's say they take these out of an excavator. How healthy are those batteries when they pull them out of a you know Volvo VNR electric semi truck as an example? They say on average, 80% health is still in the battery pack at the end of its usable life cycle. That to me seems really high, especially as we're starting to see uh, warranties and not starting, it's been this way for a while, warranty 70% state of health while it's still in the car for only 100, 120,000 miles. So I big think, go ahead. Sorry, Max. not to jump in, but a big distinction I want to make there, Kyle, right, is if this is coming from like construction equipment, heavy duty stuff, it's a vastly different use case than let's say an electric car that spent most of its life being charged a certain way, being driven a certain way. And of course, because consumers have the range expectations of their car, usually that 80% figure has been a very commonly like attributed floor of degradation that a consumer would want in their car. Now, 
frankly, I don't know in the construction or in the heavy duty industries what's acceptable. Is there a level at which there's so much battery degradation, the cells just can't perform as much? And so these second life companies are going to get, therefore, not great you know, battery packs? Or is this uh, a situation, too, where these industries you know, are using the batteries to the best of their ability, but by the time they offload them, that 80% is still plenty enough for energy storage where, okay, maybe you have some extra dead weight and you have cells that don't work optimally, but because it's static energy storage and not powering a moving working vehicle, maybe that's okay. Uh, there's two two questions outstanding that I still haven't had answered from anyone in this industry yet. Maybe some of the viewers who are more experts than us can answer this as well. The first is costing. How do you sell a product that has a variable energy capacity because they're coming out of used equipment? They're not all going to have the same capacity. Um, how do you price that when you go to install it? Because at the end of the day, if it's used batteries, everyone's getting a different total capacity in their system that they're buying. So that's the first question. The second question is when you're taking the cells out of these vehicles, whatever the batteries were used for previously, when you charge and discharge them at varying states of health, you're going to have some imbalance over time. Each cell is going to perform slightly differently because they have different resistance built up. They have different degradation inside. How do you line up all of the cells in the system to perform consistently so that they all balance, they all get treated the same way, and one cell isn't getting worked harder than the other? Um, those are two outstanding questions for something like this that I haven't totally figured out. Now, this is not the first time we've seen um, used batteries being used for situations like this. I don't know, Max, if you remember the video, I filmed at the Audi charging hub last year in um, it just north of Ingolstadt, somewhere near Nuremberg, and they used old e-tron like prototype development battery packs from their fleet that they crushed. They used all the battery packs there as energy storage for the on-site DC fast charger. And that was a question I asked the Audi guys. I'm like, all these battery packs of varying states of health and varying performance levels, how do you balance it out? And they were like, oh, we, we don't know. You're asking the wrong guy. So what's your impression of that, Max, as someone who's fairly familiar with EVs and batteries? Like, do you think they're gonna be priced differently based off of capacity and performance? Yeah, no, great question. I think on the cost angle of things, to be honest, I can't see how this makes sense at this industrial scale if it's not some kind of bulk pricing. I don't think we're going to have someone negotiating, okay, your individual truck battery will do this, will do this. I mean, if we're talking about large scale grid kind of energy applications, you might as well just have some bulk pricing factoring in some kind of error margin or deviation that you're going to have in batteries. And I think the value of, you know, Volvo working with another company here at Connected Energy is Connected Energy CEO has basically said a big part of their value add in this chain is their kind of unique BMS system, right? Because the battery modules that you take may be disparate and they may have different levels of condition and they may even be, you know, configured differently, operating voltages, I'm sure. There's all kinds of uh, just simple electrical engineering problems to solve. But I think if you have basically a smart kind of brain or BMS uh, powering that in its second life, then hopefully that can help kind of intelligently figure out, okay, how much can we utilize each part of the which specific modules, maybe at a sub-module level, like what works best. I'm not a battery engineer, but I feel like just having basically the central processing and intelligence into these batteries is going to be a big part of what energy storage brings to Volvo and this partnership. Yep, that that makes sense to me. Um, you know, I, I think when we when we think about used batteries, I guess maybe even back to this particular topic, this is already a known service that they're providing. So Volvo's already testing their battery energy storage system in Stockholm, I think, is or in Gothenburg is where their headquarters typically are, but somewhere yeah. in Sweden is where they're testing it. But they haven't tested it with the used Volvo batteries yet. So the, the overall energy storage system exists. The big change here is it's going to be powered by used Volvo batteries. Um, and, and great, cool. We'll just, you know, they got to tie all that in together and, and see how it works and which applications it works best for. 
Uh, DC charging seems like a great one to me, but not necessarily a perfect solution, especially at a site that has constant demand. You'll just run the batteries out and, and drain them after a little while. It really works great for rural charging or charging where there could be huge peaks like depots during certain times of the day that you can plan when to use them could be interesting. But even beyond Volvo and beyond this project, the concept of second life of batteries is something that we really need to cover a lot more closely because uh, there's a couple topics. The first is there's companies like Redwood, which you're very familiar with. Uh, basically, the the whole problem with Redwood right now is batteries aren't degrading as fast as everyone thought. They were getting into cars. They're lasting a lot longer than everyone expected. And so there, there's not a massive amount of Second Life used EV batteries at the moment. You get them hit in bulk. We'll have a story coming up on Rivian dismantling a whole bunch of prototype um, Rivian EDV vans. Like you get these huge spikes of, you know, test fleets, early cars, flooded cars, crashed cars that come in. But it's not like the batteries of a 2012 Model S are, are dead. They're still totally functional in the vehicle. So it's going to take some more years until we still have a constant supply of Second Life batteries from cars. And then what do you do with them? Do you send them to a remanufacturing facility like Redwood or like a few others that we've seen reported on recently? Or do you take a whole module or the whole pack out of the car? Like, for example, Model 3s are extremely common. I could see someone coming up with a stationary energy storage system for just Model 3 battery packs because there's just so many out there. Um, what, what do you think is the ideal solution or is it a mix of all the above, Max? Uh, well, I think you did a great job outlining it. I think it just depends on the uniformity and scale at which you can get batteries. Like with Model 3, a product like that where we have incredibly appreciable volume and you know, in a few years, there probably will be a plenty of, you know, acceptably degraded batteries to go into that, then yes, you can probably design systems out of this that use those. However, for cases where you're hoping to harvest batteries from different kind of EVs, different kinds of battery packs, my intuition would be that it's going to be more challenging, maybe than it's worth. And at that point, you might want to go more to Redwood's level, or perhaps even deeper, the point of just scrapping the battery down to raw materials and re-refining them into a purpose-built solution maybe that makes more sense. I mean, the reuse versus recycle argument here, I think is fascinating because both of these are like potential outcomes. And it's awesome just to see that they're in competition with each other. It's not like, from what I hear, just reading and tangentially hearing from experts, it's not like, oh, no, we have no idea what to do with these materials. It's more of like, a competition for like what's the best and most efficient way we can actually take care of these batteries and old EVs. Definitely. I think that's why the pairing of the, you know, battery focused company with the more automotive focused company is great because they can kind of help to create the system and processes of triaging kind of what happens when these batteries are ready to go. Could they be repaired even? Is that a first step? And then does it go to reuse or recycling? And then, I mean, in terms of Redwood materials being uh, ahead, I feel like that's good. I mean, I can only imagine the work that they're doing at their plants to figure out the exact right processes to break these batteries down and then do it at scale when it is time. But it is a question of when does that happen? Is Because as we're saying, the life of the EV battery isn't close to over if what they're saying is true is the 80%. So, I mean, I know there's curious applications all around and that they want to commercialize this effort. Who do you all think would be the primary market of the customers that they would even think to sell or who would be interested in buying these EVs? I know we have examples, but who actually existing today do you think would hop on that? You mean by the uh, stationary storage system? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. So if you look at Electrify America as an example, I think they have over 250 charging locations where they use brand new Tesla battery storage systems as a grid buffer. Uh, how much of a cooler story would it have been for Electrify America if they could use recycled batteries and not have a Tesla badge on it for them? <laughs> I mean, that I'm sure they would have gone for that. They were locked into Tesla because they were the only ones who could provide, uh, you know, the the storage needed. And so th those types of situation, EVgo, even uh, any DC charging uh, network, I think would be a, a great solution for something like this, especially in areas where there is either really dirty power 
or power that's not consistent or charging that may not be so consistent. To me, that's the one that comes to mind, but I'm sure there's countless situations that need uh, a, a buffer situation of varying size. Right. I mean, EV goes, one of their main things is that they offset with 100% renewable energy. So this would only Well, they the... claim they offset with 100% renewable energy. Yes. This would help with that. Yes, exactly. That kind of image of sustainability. So it's something we need to cover more and, uh, you know, cool to see Volvo working on it. There's other automakers as well and uh, other, you know, truck makers, et cetera, that are getting into this space. We'll keep covering it here on this podcast. So exciting to see this. And maybe we'll even go visit one uh, in 2025. They said they'll have the first uh, commercial ready unit uh, in the ground. Very cool. Yes, I think that the recycling of batteries and then the life cycle of EVs in general is very interesting. I'm excited to cover it and get into the nitty gritty details of how companies are planning to do that. Because if we're really going to go for an electric transportation system, we're going to have to make sure that we think cradle to cradle. Max, any last thoughts? Uh, absolutely agree with everything you said, uh, Francie. I think just the lifetime, you know, cost of these cars is such a big concern on people's minds. And I have no doubt that, you know, with systems like what Volvo and Connected Energy are doing, uh, the, the supply is going to be there. And then what, you know, Kyle touched on the demand is also, I have no doubt, going to be there at a site level for, of course, charging providers, but also even at a more substantial scale for grids, local grids, national grids. I mean, Tesla, right, has such big business. I believe it's in Australia already with a lot of their energy storage products. So I have no doubt plenty of other companies want to get into that game. There's also plenty of, of sure green energy subsidies that will, you know, be applicable and help kind of finance this revolution. So from my perspective, largely dealing on out of a spec guide with consumers, you know, a lot of people are so concerned with electric vehicles with this aspect of them, like, oh, these batteries, what's going to happen? What they're going to wear out. And like we've established here, I think today that like one, it takes them quite a while to actually wear out and properly managed, properly thermally controlled cars, which is most cars in the market now. And even when they do, we have these really promising and super interesting from a both economical and energy point of view. Um, th these markets to look forward to. So I'm just super excited about it. I think it's awesome. Uh, I, no matter what happens, I have no doubt that there's going to be a ton of applications here. It is a amazing space for innovation and creative thinking. Well, thank you, Kyle and Max, for joining me today. Uh, we will continue to cover interesting stories. Feel free to email uh, podcasts at out of or podcast at outofspecstudios.com or tweet me at hey underscore Francie if you come across interesting stories and just let us know if what kind of stories that you're interested in me covering. And we look forward to tuning in with you next time. See you Thanks. guys. Bye. Bye.